So we were sitting in the waiting room, and she could tell how nervous and scared I was. And she said, oh, I see a big basket of books over there in the corner. Why don't you go get some of those books and bring it over, and we'll read them together to, to make you feel a little bit better before you see the, the new dentist. And so I went over to where the basket was, and um, I pulled out a book, and it was a hardcover book, so I knew it was kind of expensive, because when I was young, hardcover books were the expensive books. And I opened the page, and something stood up in the center of it, and I had never seen that before. I mean, literally, something was standing up on the inside in between the pages. And I was just fascinated. I, the creative little young artist in me just went crazy when I saw it. And I turned the page, and there were things where you would pull something, and something would move on the inside. And I was fascinated by that. I don't, I don't remember the rest of the dentist visit. I don't remember anything else about that. But I remember that basket having nothing but pop-up books um, inside of it. And so as soon as I went home after the dentist or, or following that, I started to experiment with making pop-ups at a very young age just because I was a curious, creative person. You know, I would peek in beside the pages and see how things worked. And, you know, when Christmas would come around, I would ask for pop-up books as gifts because they just, not only did I think books were magic, you know, just the pictures and the words, but seeing something like that open was utterly unbelievable to me. Well, growing up in rural Michigan in the 70s, the late 70s, you know, things were so much simpler. I there were no big superstores of art supplies, for example, like Crayola made crayons. That's all they made. Like, were 64, you got the 64 box, which was awesome, or 128 with a little sharpener, and you could sharpen the crayons. And that's all Crayola made. But now they make a million different kinds of things, you know, all different kinds of stuff. But when I was a boy, when I was a young artist, there were, that didn't exist. So if I wanted to make something like a pop up, there was no staples to go into the store and, and get cardstock to make a pop-up. I had to find that material on my own. And my mother was a secretary at Ford Motor Company, and she worked in the personnel department there. She'd worked there for many years. Being originally from Michigan, everyone's connected to the automobile industry there. So she was a secretary at Ford Motor Company in personnel. And when somebody got fired, she would dump out their manila filing folders and then bring them home to me, and I could cut them up and make them into pop-ups. And it was great because it was just the right consistency, the right weight for making pop-ups, and they were blank. So I could color them, make any kind of picture, make any kind of story that I wanted to on them at all. It was really very much a, a make-do kind of creative time for, for kids in the 70s. But at that time when I started, there was nobody. There wasn't even a book to teach me how to do it. I mean, there are, today there are books for adults and for kids about how to make pop-ups. But at that time, there was nothing. But I guess, I guess being from the Midwest, it's sort of this really can-do kind of attitude. Like, if you can't find you know, someone to show you how to do it or find a book, you've got to figure it out yourself. And so it was really just a matter of sort of figuring out myself. But it's funny that you mentioned sort of like a mentor or a group of people because I think that oftentimes people who are not involved in children's books envision this big support group that we all have where we all talk to each other and get together and hang out and drink and eat guacamole and chips and everything and to, to my mod, to my knowledge that doesn't really happen or maybe it does happen I'm just not invited like I'm the odd man out or something but we really we really don't do that it's surprisingly in some ways very much a solitary kind of a field and maybe that makes it more like an art field than anything else because we're still working in our own little world, in our own little environments. Not to say that I don't have support, but a creative world is usually a very solitary, sometimes a little bit lonely kind of field. You know, when you're, when you're young, oh, oh, when you're young, <laughs> when you're young, really, you wear rose-colored glasses, and I'm, I, you know, I still do that to this day. I distinctly remember when I was putting together my first pop-up book, it was an alphabet book. It was Christmas alphabet, so there were 26 pop-ups inside. And I remember thinking, oh, this is, how hard is this really going to be, right? Not having ever done this before, why I picked 26 pop-ups, I have no idea. But I distinctly remember getting the few easy ones done and then quickly kind of getting caught, you know, sort of bogging down not so much lacking the creative idea of what I wanted to do, but the physical knowledge, the engineering knowledge of what I wanted to make happen. So that was very, very difficult at, the, at that beginning time. I remember so distinctly trying to make the snowflake in that book and thinking, why won't this do what I wanted to do? Or, and then quickly, okay, you have to come up with something. So you have to figure out how to make it do what you want to do. And I also remember thinking at the time, this is like the 
best that I can do right now. Like looking back today at that book, of course I could make something you know, much more elaborate if I wanted to. But at that time when I was, oh my gosh, in my 20s, <laughs> I remember thinking, this is the best I can do with this right now because I just don't, I don't have the knowledge or the ability to take this any further than where it's at now. So it was a struggle. It was a, and it was a struggle not only on that level, it was a struggle for a certain level of acceptance for what I was trying to do. I, the publisher was great. It was with Orchard Books, and um, Neil Porter was my editor there, and he completely supported the project. He would, kept telling me, this is going to be a great book, and you know everybody's excited about it, and the sales reps are all fired up, but unbeknownst to me, behind closed doors, the sales reps thought it was going to be a massive flop. They it was all the pop-ups were white what was that about like no pop-up book had ever had white pop-ups on the inside of it before and it was I think it was like almost twenty dollars and no children's book had ever been twenty dollars before so they were not anticipating any success with that title in the least and fortunately they were proved wrong because I think sometimes we underestimate the reading community we underestimate the book community we underestimate the types of things that they will take into their homes you know Someone may not necessarily love a pop-up book, but if it's a book that they think is beautiful or interesting or they want to share it and it happens to be a pop-up book, they'll get it. And that's exactly what happened with uh, Christmas Alphabet. So there were a lot of challenges involved in it, but looking back on it, I wouldn't have done anything different. For some reason, this fancy term paper engineer came about, and I, it came from the, from the 70s. Uh, there was a company here in the United States, uh, Intervisual Books, who was really sort of creating the second golden age of pop-up books. The first golden age was in the late 1800s. The second golden age started in the early 70s. And they sort of coined the term paper engineer, and I think that was just almost for lack of any other way to describe what it was. I mean, just the mechanical part, just the, the mechanics of, of creating a pop-up. Those, those people, those individuals, were called paper engineers. Although I did once have a very embarrassing encounter. I was at a, um, at a conference or a convention, I'm not sure where it was, and it was a very long day. Oh my gosh, it was so long, I had signings and everything. And then at that night, I went down to the bar, which was very, very crowded, just to relax and have a drink. And the guy standing next to me, we struck up a conversation, and you're just chatting. It's the end of a long day, and everyone had a long day. And so, <clears throat> He says to me, well, uh, what do you do for a living? And I said, oh, I'm a paper engineer. And he's like, you're kidding me. I'm a paper engineer. I said, no way. He said, yeah. You know, he's like, what's your name? I said, my name is Robert Sabuto. He said, really? And I said, what's your name? And he told me his name. And I said, I'm so sorry that I don't know you. I said, you know, the paper engineering community is so small. I feel like I know everybody who's, who's you know, in the paper engineering world. And I said, so, you know, what books have you worked on? He said, what books have I worked on? Well, what are you talking about? I said, well, you said you're a paper engineer. He said, yeah. I engineer paper. I take fiber and water. I'm a scientist. I actually engineer the actual paper. I'm here for paper conference. What do you do? And I said, I make pop-up books. <laughs> and I scurried away because I felt so stupid because here was this guy who was really a paper engineer and I was just using this term that someone had made up in the 70s to describe myself. So I try, sometimes I use paper engineer, but I prefer not to use that. Usually when people ask, I just say I'm a bookmaker because I do so much now. I mean, I write, illustrate, do the engineering. I'm just involved in so many aspects that sometimes bookmaker just seems more realistic than saying, you know, paper engineer, this fancy job that I have paper. The guy makes pop-up books. I think that one of the challenges of creating three-dimensional books in the way that I do is the the level of limitations that has been one of the biggest challenges and by that I mean when an artist is creating a picture book in two dimensions a flat two-dimensional picture book the sky's the limit you can do anything you want you can draw anything you want you can paint anything you want, anything any small big anything you want to do but working um, with a pop-up book a three-dimensional book one has to obey the laws of physics. I mean, the paper will not always do what you would like it to do in your mind. And that is a real challenge. I mean, I can't just, you know, you can, you can make a staircase, sure, but can you make the staircase, you know, move? You know, what, what is the paper willing to let you do? And, and there's also an element of time when I'm working uh, with pop-ups because the page opens. At a certain in a certain time span, and certain things on the inside can also move at different speeds. So technically, I guess I work in four dimensions because there's an element of time. And again, the paper is very tricky that way. Sometimes, if I want the paper to move faster so it doesn't strike something, it won't do that. 
And if I turn the book upside down when I'm working to try to get it to do that, it, it may not work that way. So there are, are many limitations of just getting the paper to work within a three-dimensional space. And I think that's one of the most frustrating things for uh, some of the designers at my studio, because I have some designers who work for me there, for them to really come to terms with that, that, that the paper is the king in the studio and, and all its quirks and nuances have to be obeyed sort of with the utmost respect. Actually, all pop-up books are manufactured by hand, so somebody physically folds and glues every single piece into every single pop-up book that ever existed ever. Like I collect antique books, antique pop-up books, and so some of them have pull tabs on them and, and instead of like a little plastic rivet, today we use little plastic rivets, like they're little wire coils, like little teeny wire coils so that the, you can pull it and something will move. And I look at that, you know, and I have one from like 1840, so I look at that and I think, Somebody hand assembled that in 1840 and put those pieces and hand colored the pages that are on the book, which fascinates me. So that tradition continues today. All pop up books being made by hand overseas. They're not done in the United States and they're made mostly in South America and in Asia. So uh, I'll go over to China or to Thailand or someone from my studio will go to oversee that production. And how that works is. After we create, um, we create the pop-ups, you know, we, we design and create the pop-ups and we make like drawings, flat drawings of all the pieces. So, so every pop-up book has all these pieces that are made, little pieces to it. And we make them on the computer and they're called die lines because they'll be used to make a die, which is like a cookie cutter that will stamp out all the pieces for the book. So we send the die lines to the manufacturer overseas. They build this big die mold, this big block of wood with these, all these cookie cutters in it. And then the printed pages press on it and all the pieces are cut out. Um, all those pieces are counted. Somebody counts. Oh, what's your job? I have to count 500,000 pieces for dinosaurs. They count them. Uh, they go into the hand assembly room. And that room is unlike anything Actually, that is unlike anything you'll ever see in your life. It's an enormous room that has like a thousand hand assemblers in it. And they all sit at these long tables. And all they do are assemble pop-up books. Like each side of the table is responsible for just one pop-up or one page in the book. So, so that, that side of the table or that table becomes the experts at making that one particular pop-up. Like the T-Rex head from Dinosaurs, you know, somebody will put the teeth in, somebody will put the tongue in, and hand it to the next person, and then they'll put the sides of the head on, and they'll hand it to the next person, and it'll go all the way down the row of people, and at the very end, it'll be a finished T-Rex head. And then they'll hand it across the table, and somebody will glue it into the page, and somebody will glue the arms on. So all they'll do is make, like, a million T-Rexes for the book. And then the pages will be all glued together by hand, and then somebody will glue the cover, the boards, that even gets glued into the book by hand. And that process is, they're very quick at it. They, they assemble so much faster than we do at my studio, it's not even funny. They can make 20, I think they can make like 25,000 books in a week. 25,000 books in a week, yes, which is a lot of books, but fortunately pop-up books have become very popular. And so if, if they have a print run of 500,000 you know, books, 25,000 books doesn't sound like a lot. You know, you're obviously taking, taking months and months and months to get all of those books finished and completed. I love pop-ups that are just in white because I love the way that, you know, the simplicity of the light and the shadow plays on the shape. And I think that in our busy, crazy world of, you know, uh, Blackberries and DVDs and computers and everything, there's all this kind of static and noise things going on, visually too. And so I like working in white a lot because it's just a quiet moment. You know, you open the page and there's this white kind of sculpture that's on the inside. And for me, I find that very soothing. People say, you know, oh, you must love children and you write, you know, you make these books for children that are great. And I like children, you know, they're okay and everything, but I really make my books for the child of me. You know, things that really interest me and excite me. I'm always getting ideas from people about pop-up books. You should do a pop-up book about that, or you should do a pop-up book about motorcycles. Well, I don't even drive a car. I mean, I'm never going to do a pop-up book on motorcycles because that does not interest me. You know, so I'm only going to work on the stuff that I really find sort of interesting and creative. So a lot of my holiday titles are just white because I love it. It reminds me of my, my childhood in Michigan when it was very snowy. You know, before global warming, there was a lot of snow in Michigan, and it just takes me back to that. But for other books, like... Um, Encyclopedia Prehistorica Dinosaurs, you know, that book requires a different look. E each book should be illustrated as the manuscript dictates. You know, if I'm doing a book on the 12 Days of Christmas, I love working in white, that's going to have a very quiet, subtle, 
beautiful you know view to it. If I'm working on something like Encyclopedia Prehistorica, that has to have something totally different. It has to it has to feel old. It has to feel fun, even though you know everything's been dead for millions of years. It has to feel scaly and textury, and so each book is really sort of dictated by that. And that continues also into the future. You know, I'm starting another series, Encyclopedia Prehistoric, Encyclopedia Mythologica, and so that will require a whole new look. You know. You know, I'm investigating using marbleized paper because the first book in the series is called Fairy, which is unicorns and wizards and fairies. And you know, I see like marbleized paper for a lot of those surfaces and textures. So that's really all dictated by the story or the message I'm really trying trying to convey in a book. So this is Castle that I wanted to share with you. This is a a new imprint that Matthew and I have started to sort of foster new talent, new paper engineers, new illustrators for projects that we can oversee in our studio that we would love to do but we don't necessarily have the time to do it with our hands. So this is our uh, sort of our foray into nonfiction. I love nonfiction and I love history and so I knew the first title for this series, uh, this imprint would be Castles. Here we have of course an enormous castle on the inside and I, I people always say well what is it about pop-ups that you know are so attractive or why do they inspire so many people and we sort of say it's the wow factor you know it's the surprise factor you don't know what's gonna happen you see the cover of the book and you're like yeah you know this looks really nice and then you turn the page and you see something like that I even love that wow factor and these books have little side pop-ups too a little teeny castle and some more this series um this this whole nonfiction series was also really really kind of a request from, from the teaching community because a lot of teachers were coming to book signings, book signings and, and saying, oh, you know, we love your pop-up books. We wish there was more that we could use in our classroom, you know, to use as part of our, our lesson plan or as teaching tools. And so, you know, we said, hey, we hear you. And, and I just love fun kind of stories. And, you know, the medieval times, just like dinosaurs, were not all dry and crusty and kids want fun stuff and they want to see what it's like to live inside, live inside, you know, different different aspects of the castle and we've even got some pull tabs here. This is our jousting scene. So yeah. yeah. You know, when I was a boy I would have loved this, right? Just seeing all this cool stuff. If I was a boy I totally would have had this book. I would have made someone get it for me. Uh, for Christmas or give it to me for my birthday. So, you know, and then even more at the end, the king doing a little knighting at the very end. So, so I like to think that, you know, not only are, do I want pop-up books to be fun, you know, I hope they're going to be fun, the books that we make are fun, but I, I would like to think that if they can be used in the classroom, if they can be used in the library and story time, you know, then my, then my work is completed and hopefully I've done a good job with it. The Reading Rockets Meet the Author series is a production of WETA. Major funding for Reading Rockets comes from the United States Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs. For more author interviews, recommended reading lists, and information about teaching kids to read, please visit us online at www.readingrockets.org.